As always, praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Please take your Bibles again and turn to Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah the 6th chapter, we'll be looking at this passage of Scripture here this morning. And as Rick read it to you, I'm sure you were able to discern what a challenging passage of Scripture this is. Uh, in this passage of Scripture, uh, the sins of the people of God are being laid out before them. And in a very real way, what we see happening here is that God is setting before them the very reasons uh, for that uh, judgment that is about to fall. One of the challenges uh, of this uh, of preaching through this book of Jeremiah thus far has been the reality that over and over again we have to come back to this theme of the judgment of God upon his people because of their sin. And one of the things that you might remember is that a few weeks ago, a few sermons ago, uh, one of the things that I asked and requested and prayed about is that God would give to us uncircumcised ears. Do you remember that? That's taken from the passage in verse 10 of Jeremiah chapter 6. Uh, one of God's complaints against the people is that they had these uncircumcised ears. And because their ears were uncircumcised, they were unable or unwilling to hear in any kind of a saving way or any kind of a correcting way God's word to them. And one of my concerns was that with this repeated emphasis of the judgment of God coming upon those who, have, who, have, who refuse to repent of their sin, one of my concerns would be that our ear, ears would be dull to the repeated message of God's judgment upon unrepentant nations and people. And I hope and I pray as we revisit this matter again today that your ears at this point are not dull of hearing concerning the reality of divine judgment upon sin. Now, as I said before, this has been something that we've seen in almost every one of our sermons. Every one of our sermons have dealt with this reality of sin. And the only way to escape the effects of sin is by way of uh, repentance, both personal and national. And again, just to, to remind you of what we did the last time we were together, I was very much encouraged, I have to say, both on uh, the last Lord's Day when our brother Bob preached, and then uh, Wednesday night when, uh, when, when, uh, when our brother Fred, uh, uh, again, uh, gave to us the, the study on Wednesday night. Both of those messages concerned or centered around the idea of repentance. And if I can say it this way, repentance is that which is always timeful, it's always needed. And so again, to hear these things, to hear this emphasis, as I said uh, on Wednesday night, it did my soul well to hear that. But to remind you of what we covered the last time I, I, I opened up the scripture to you, we were in Jeremiah chapter 5. And you might remember that when you look in Jeremiah chapter 5, there were two passages of scripture, Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 9 and then Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 29. And those two passages contained a similar expression. And that expression was, such a nation is this. And God was making clear that because uh, Judah had become, quote unquote, such a nation as this, judgment would come upon them. And do you remember what we did with that passage? We tried to evaluate not only the, the nation of Judah at that time, we tried to evaluate our own nation as well. And we asked ourselves the question, are we such a nation as this, as was described there in Jeremiah chapter 5? And to show how close we as a people in our present day are to quote unquote such a nation as this, what we did is we looked at two of the themes that, uh, Jer that God through Jeremiah was bringing out. And, two, and those two themes were number one, that the people of Jeremiah's day were people that were given over to, to sexual sin. Sexual sin was one of the things that marked the people of Jeremiah's day. And we asked the question, is that true of our day? Are we therefore such a nation as this? The other thing that we saw by way of uh, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 29, is that in that section of that chapter, Jeremiah was dealing not so much with, social, with, with sexual sins, but with what we would call social sins. Those sins where those in power and authority were oppressing the weak and the needy. And we ask ourselves the question, are we as a people guilty of those type of sins? And if so, again, we, are we then such a nation as this? And one of the things that you might remember is that what we, did, what we have done in every one of these sermons that have, that have contained these themes of judgment, what we've done in every one of these sermons is to show that in those very passages of Scripture, God makes a way of blessing or a way of escape by way of repentance. And so we'll come back to this here today. And we will see again in this sixth chapter of the, of the book of Jeremiah, we will see again God giving an assessment of the nation 
And we're going to see that in verses, I think it's 26 down through verse 30. There's that passage there where, where Jeremiah is said to be set as a tester of metals from the ESV, or as the, uh, uh, as, as the King James expresses it a little different. But the idea is this, Jeremiah would be now testing and assaying to see what the, what the quality of the nation was. So he gives this assessment of the nation. The next thing that we're going to see here is that God gives an analysis, a little different than an assessment. The analysis is a little more thorough, an analysis of the sins that were bringing upon the nation the judgment of God. And one of the things that we're going to see, and it's grievous to see, but one of the things that we're going to see is that there was a failure, not only in the people at large, but there was a failure, especially in the religious and spiritual leadership. There were these prophets who, what did they do? They healed the hurt of my daughter slightly, saying, peace, peace. Again, they, they promised them peace and comfort when they, should have been, when they should have been preaching about repentance. And then the last thing that we're going to see here is the answer that God gives to this, to this difficulty that the nation is in. And it's not going to surprise us that the answer uh, that God gives us, uh, 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 I'm sorry, that the answer that God gives us uh, to, the, to the quandary that the nation is in is once again that good old-fashioned grace of repentance and faith. And we're going to see, this is why Jeremiah says, where God says uh, through Jeremiah in verse 16, seek the ancient paths, seek the old ways. And so again, we'll, we'll, we'll develop all these things here today. And so from this passage of scripture, what I want to do is I want to, I want to do a number of things. We're going to be making some, if, I, if you'll allow me to say it this way, we're going to be making some strategic movements in this passage of scripture. The first thing that I want to do by way of a, you know, allow me a strategic movement is to identify for you the doctrine that I'll be pre uh, presenting to you here today. And the doctrine is not a doctrine that I'm going to uh, formulate or put together. The doctrine is found in verse 16. Look at verse 16 there of, uh, of the sixth chapter. This is the doctrine. This is the, this is the, the essential uh, point of the message here today. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the old ways and ask for the old paths. And where is the God? Where is the good way? And walk ye there. In. That's the doctrine. The doctrine is in the text itself. We don't have to draw anything from it. It's very clear and it's very plain. What is God saying in this chapter of scripture? He is saying, seek ye the old ways. Seek the ways of God. And we'll develop that here. But the next thing I want to do by way of a strategic um, uh, movement in this, uh, in this sermon is I want to, I want to use uh, verses, uh, uh, verses uh, 26 through 30 as, the, as our starting point. And the reason why I want to come to verses uh, 26 through 30 as our starting point is because I believe that this passage of Scripture, this section, really gives an overview of the entire chapter in and of itself. What we're dealing with in this sixth chapter is, once again, a setting forth of the thoroughness of the nation's corruption and the thoroughness of the nation's sin. And the way that that thoroughness is, is, is presented to us is under the picture of of an assayer or, an, or a tester of metal, metals. And it's very interesting what we see happening here because what God is going to do is he's going to use the image of a, of a man who is, a, who is a smelting a ore trying to find the precious metal uh, and distinguishing it from the, from the non-precious metal, uh, the base material we might say. He is uh, looking for uh, the, uh, the precious metal as opposed to the impurities that are there. And he's doing that in such a way, in a, in, in a way that pictures for us the very things that, the very things that God is doing here. So again, this passage of scripture then is going to set before us, as I said before, a platform that which we can, we can uh, look at this entire uh, passage of scripture, this entire sixth chapter. And so look at verses 26 uh, through 30 once again and read what we have here. O daughter of my people, gird thee with sackcloth and wallow thyself in ashes and make mourning as for an only son, a most bitter lamentation, for the spoiler shall suddenly come upon us. I have set thee as a tower and fortress among my people that thou mayest know and try their way. They are all grievous revolters, walking with slanderers. They are brass and iron, and they are all corruptors. The bellows are burned, and the lead is consumed with fire, and the founder melteth in vain, for the, uh, for the wickedness, for the wicked is, are not plucked away. Reprobate or rejected silver shall men call them, because the Lord has rejected them. As I said before, this is, this is something of a picture here. 
And the picture that we have set before us is a process of smelting uh, precious metals from ore that is still used to this day. Uh, the, the, the very uh, procedure that is uh, outlined here for us is, is, again, as I said before, still used today. And the procedure is something like this, that uh, ore is taken from a mountain, it's dug out. It is then crushed and pulverized to something of a powder. Uh, that, power, uh, that powder is, a, is subjected uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a container to extreme heat, uh, sometimes as much as uh, 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, in that and then additionally, not only is the powder put in there and heated up, but lead is put in there as well. And in that process, what begins to happen is that the impurities burn off, become slag, and interestingly enough, the precious metals adhere to the lead. And then after that process is done, this, this molten mixture is poured into a, a specific uh, a casting. And normally that casting is, is shaped in something of an inverted pyramid. And there's a reason for that. Because as, the molten, uh, as, the, as that molten mixture is poured into that casting, what ends up happening is that the precious metals that have adhered to the lead sink to the bottom of that inverted pyramid. Once that cools down and taken out of the casting, that precious metal will be at the tip of that pyramid. So that's all the impurities are, are chipped away. And then that little, and it's oftentimes just a little ball of lead with the precious metals, are now again subjected once again to another process of heating up. And in that process of heating up, what ends up happening is that the lead is separated from the silver. Well, in this specific case, what, is, what God is saying, what has happened to his people Judah, is that he's gone through this smelting process. He's gone through this process of purification, and he has found nothing of worth in the nation. The nation has become thoroughly corrupt. How many times have we seen this already in this book of Jeremiah? From the least of them to the greatest, from the prophet to the priest. How many times have we he heard this in the book of Jeremiah where the corruption was thorough? And now in this passage of scripture, we have here this very vivid, vivid image of this process of smelting and this process of determining whether or not there was anything uh, of, of any use uh, in, uh, in, in, that, uh, in that furnace. And sadly, what we see here is that there is nothing of any use. And that now becomes the basis for what we're going to see in the remainder of the chapter. The very fact that there was nothing of value in that molten mixture points out to us now the reason for the severity of the judgment that is to fall. Did you read in those opening passages of the scripture? Flee, uh, uh, flee, flee, Jeru uh, flee Jerusalem. Uh, all kind of judgment was going to come on the, on the daughter of my people. Every strata of society was going to be affected by this judgment. There's that passage of scripture early in the, uh, er early in the chapter where God says almost in a way that, that is surprising to us. He speaks about, a, a, again, that, that judgment will come on the, on, on the child. Judgment will come on the aged. Judgment will come on the, on, the, on the husband. Judgment will come on the wife. And what is he saying here? That, the, that the, because the society is so thoroughly corrupted, judgment will come on the entirety of the society. And so these are the things that we're seeing here. As I said before, this is a very, uh, very uh, uh, telling uh, passage of scripture by way of this uh, revealing of the corruption of the nation. Now, because the nation was so corrupt, they were under this severe judgment. But this is not the only thing that we see by, uh, by way of, again, the, 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 the response that God is making, uh, making here. Yes, the judgment, was, uh, the judgment was going to be thorough because the corruption was thorough. But we also see not only that, as I said, that's the assessment. The assessment is that the entire nation, again, had been corrupted with, with, uh, with, with wickedness and with sin. And I come back to what we considered in chapter 5, that phrase, such a nation as this. Such a nation as this. We looked, at those, we looked at those distinguishing characteristics in that fifth chapter. And one of the things that we saw was that there are so many things that would cause us to be identified as such a nation as this. So that's the assessment. The next thing I want you to see in this passage of scripture, in this chapter, is the analysis that God gives. He has given this general assessment, reprobate, rejected silver, nothing in the or nothing in the mixture as of any value. And now he's going to give the analysis as to why this is the case. Why is this the case? 
And while we can go to a number of passages of scripture as to why, uh, as, as to the analysis here, I want to I want to just focus on four passages that show the corruption of the nation uh, of the nation. And I want to say this as we go through this: Let's not look at this passage of scripture in merely a historical setting. Let's look at neither. Let us look at this passage of scripture as to see what the nation that we live in looks like. Let's. Go to this passage of scripture and let it be something of, a, of an evaluation of our own hearts. Where do we stand in these things? But notice when God begins to give the analysis of the nation, it is rejected silver. Why? And I would say this, number one, it is rejected silver because look in verse 13. From the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is given the covetousness. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. There is the primary reason that we see. There is, this, there is this failure, not only in the people at large, but there is especially this failure in the leadership, in the spiritual leadership. And there is so much to say about the reality of, 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 the, of the, the health, the spiritual health of a nation or of a, of a, or of a congregation rising and falling on spiritual leadership. And the spiritual leadership here was corrupt. The spiritual leadership, again, was weak. Rather than confronting sin, they were allowing men to go on in their sin, saying, peace, peace. And so that's the first thing that we see here. There was a corruption that, 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 that had affected uh, every level of society. We've already made that point. But there are specifics now as well. The general assessment, the general analysis. Now the specifics. And notice what the specifics are. Number one, that this people was filled with oppression. Now, again, let me say this. It's sometimes uh, I think uh, from my own perspective and my own evaluation of, of, of if you'll allow me to say it this way, uh, what, my, what my themes or what my, what my points of stress are in, in preaching. Oftentimes I'm dealing with sins uh, that have to do on a more of a personal nature, uh, particularly sexual sins. Uh, this is an issue that we must all be careful with. Always, uh, again, the temptation is there to indulge sexual sins. We live in a society that, that comes at us so many ways. Uh, to uh, tempting us in this way and we have to give attention to that but in this passage of scripture what I want you to see this is a point that oftentimes I don't stress but needs to be stressed and when God begins to give the analysis of this nation what does he do he says that the nation was full of oppression and it is sinful to oppress the weak it is sinful to oppress those who are in need of help and notice what John, verse 6 of chapter 6 says. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, cut down the trees and cast up the siege mound against Jerusalem. That's the judgment. Why? And that's the judgment. This city must be punished. Why? There is nothing but oppression within her. This is a social sin. And I think I was mentioning on Wednesday night that when you take a look at all the prophets uh, in the word of God, they, they deal with covenantal sins. The sins of the people of Israel failing to live uh, uh, faithfully to the covenant stipulations that God laid out. We see that especially in, De in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 26 and, and 27 where God gives curses and blessings. Uh, blessing for those uh, who live according to the, to the stipulations of the covenant. Curses on those who fail. And so there are those covenantal sins. And there are these personal sins as well, but there are societal sins also. And what we begin to find is that when these personal sins and societal sins begin to be the distinguishing characteristic of any nation, that nation comes under the judgment of God, whether it's a covenant nation or not. Understand that. And so again, the first thing that we see here when we get to, when we get to a more specific analysis is that the land was filled with oppression. Again, there is nothing but oppression within her, verse 6. The second thing that we see by way of an analysis of the nation is that the, the nation itself was a fountain of wickedness. Not a fountain of refreshment, not a fountain of cleansing. It was a fountain of wickedness. Look at verse 7. As a fountain cast out her waters, so she cast out her wickedness. Violence and spoil is heard in her before me continually as grief and wounds. What do we see happening here? What we find happening here is that rather than being, again, a source of purity or a source of cleansing, the nation itself was a fountain of wickedness. Stop and think again. I Stop and think again what, what our nation represents globally. Have we been a benefit to the nation? Have we been a blessing to the nation? Now, don't get me wrong. There are many things, again, in the nation that we would be happy to see. 
Again, our brother Rick is, is mentioning uh, the work of Samaritan's person and the work again of others, again, helping those uh, who are, who've been afflicted uh, as a result of the hurricane. But when we take a look at the things that affect cultures, what we find is that our nation, sadly, sadly, has become a fountain of wickedness. And we must draw this closer to ourselves, do we not? What about my heart? Is my heart a fountain of wickedness? Or has my heart been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ? Have I been given that new heart that the scripture speaks about? You see, we must deal with these things. And when God is exposing the sin of Judah, he's laying these things out. The city was filled, the nation was filled with oppression. There was a well of wickedness. Thirdly, and I may mention this earlier, but thirdly, listen to this. The, the nation was marked by having uncircumcised ears. Now, this idea of, an uncir of uncircumcised ears is kind of interesting. Again, sometimes the, the scripture speaks about an, an uncircumcised heart. And the idea there is that it's, it, it's, a, it's insensitive to the moving of God. It's insensitive to the things of God. And I ask this morning again, where is our hearts? Do we have circumcised hearts this morning before God? Are our hearts sensitive to the things of God? But to have an uncircumcised ear essentially means this, that the word of God and its proclamation has no effect on the hearing. It cannot penetrate down into the understanding or the mind or to, and especially to the heart. And so look what verse 10 says. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach and they have no delight in it. Did you hear what is the effect of uncircumcised ears? Number one, they don't, they can't hear the word of God. Number two, they have no, they, they have no appreciation or no value of the word of God. And thirdly, there is no intention to keep the word of God. These are uncircumcised ears. Oh, do our ears need to be circumcised this morning that we would hear and that we would value and appreciate, uh, again, the word of God. The, excuse me, the idea here in verse 10, uh, they have no, the, uh, the, the, word of, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. What a, what a thing to say about the word of God. The, the word reproach, again, has this idea of, of they're, they're ashamed of it and even having more of an idea that the idea, of, the, the idea that it's odious. And the word for odious has the, has the implication of that which is hated. They don't want the word of God. And so again, these are the characteristics that are marking out this nation, filled with oppression, a well of wickedness, uncircumcised ears. And then, of course, that last designation there in verse 30, a reprobate silver or rejected silver shall men call them because the Lord hath rejected them. Or oh, do you see again what's been happening in this passage of Scripture? There was, there was Jeremiah as a tester of metals. And there was the, can I say it this way? There was the fire, the heat provided by the word of God. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29. It is not my word like a fire. And the fire of the word of God was applied to this nation. And what's happening, the refining process went on. The smelting process went on. And again, when it was all said and done, the refiner looked. And what did he find? Rejected silver. Nothing of value there. And so again, these things mark out this nation. This is the analysis of it. But the next thing that we see, and we have to mention this, is because not only was this true of the population in general, what's, what again, what's, what's even more uh, dis disconcerting is the fact that the spiritual leadership of the nation was corrupt. And this brings us again to verses 13 and 14. Again, for the least of them, unto the greatest of them, every one of them is given to covetousness, uh, even from even the prophet unto the priest, everyone deals falsely. What a designation for spiritual ministry. These men, again, as I said before, they were greedy. They were weak. They were the very things that, that spiritual leadership should not be. And these things must be said. Oh, wouldn't it be easy to kind of side skirt this, particularly, particularly myself as a, as, as a minister of the gospel? I was reading one commentator this morning. I, 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 I was, he, he had done such a good job in his passage of scripture. I was thinking about maybe I should just, and I, I'm not saying this as a joke. I was thinking maybe I should print up his, his, uh, his commentary on this passage of scripture as kind of an exposition and place it in the back of the church so you could have a copy of it. That's how good, the, that's how good of a job the man did. And one of the things that he says is essentially this. Ministers get worked over in the book of Jeremiah, and rightly so. And what we're seeing here, again, is this failure of spiritual leadership. And the failure is this, there's greed and weakness where there should be, where, where, where there should be this uh, self-serving and strength. 
The next thing that we see, and this is particularly the failure, look at verse 14. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. This was the damning sin of the ministry of that day. This was the sin, again, that, that really brought them uh, under the judgment of God. These ministers, when they should have been declaring the things of God, what were they doing? They were proclaiming a false peace. There was the nation, again, thoroughly corrupt, a fountain of wickedness, we might say. Uh, there was the nation, again, with uncircumcised ears, and, 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 and the ministers loved to have it that way. And what did they do? Again, they gave these promises of false peace. Now, it's interesting is that when we take a look at this statement of peace, peace, when there is no peace, do you know that that statement occurs probably, probably seven or eight times in the Bible? Over and over again, we have it. And there seems to be a tendency in unprincipled ministers, you pray for me, there seems to be a tendency in unprincipled ministers to proclaim peace when there is no basis for peace of the soul before God. When there is sin, that sin must be dealt with, and it must be dealt with forthrightly. Now, again, we, we know that, and I, you've probably heard me say this before, I know I've thought about this, one of the things that I don't want to be is I don't want to unnecessarily be a wrecking ball, just going around tearing people down. That's not the, the way to approach it. But I'm saying to you, in, in our day, well, I think there's less of a temptation uh, in, in that regard and more of a temptation to just kind of appease the conscience of people. Not only are preachers prone to this, and we got to come back to this because this is, this is the point of emphasis, but in order to illustrate how easily a preacher may fall into this, let me say this to you, and I'm sure that we have all done this. We've been engaged with a certain individual, and, and we're, we're not taking necessarily a, a position of superiority over a friend of ours, but a friend of ours, maybe a loved one of ours, is maybe just doing things that aren't right. And they, and, and they need to, to know about them. But, but how many times, rather than saying to them forthrightly what needs to be corrected, we've softened it in some way. We've used expressions that kind of really, at the end of the day, don't communicate the point that needs to be taken. Why? Because we don't want that person that we care about to, to can I say it so bluntly, to not like us anymore. And we know that that's what will happen. If we confront individuals in the way that need to be confronted, a lot of times we're just not going to be in that person's circle. And this is what is so this is this this is what is so damning about ministry that does that. Ministry that does that. You pray for me. I mean it sincerely. You pray for me. Ministry that does that is you talk about you talk about spiritual malpractice. For a minister who knows what the word of God says and who sees sin or failure for that man to fail to bring these things up, or even worse, to say peace, peace, when there is no peace, to say the things that God declares a sin as no sin, to say the things that are afflicting your conscience, I speak to you in a way, or a minister speaks to you in a way, or a preacher that we hear on TV or, what, or, or, or whatever, or the, the internet, whatever, and says, well, that's really not a sin. And that was a sin in that day, but it's not a sin now. Do you understand this, this proclamation of peace when there is no peace is deadly. And again, it's damning to the man who would do it. And so this, this easing of the conscience without dealing uh, with sin, that's what this false peace, that's what it is to heal the, uh, the, the hurt of, of, the, of the daughter of God slightly. What is it? It's to offer peace without dealing with sin. It's to appease the conscience without dealing with sin. And so again, we have to make sure that, that we don't fail in this regard. Can I cut close to the bone here? Can I say this? Do you know that when we, when we, when I or you engage in sin, our consciences should afflict us? Our conscience should be smitten? And if, and, 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 if, and if you hear from me or I hear from a, maybe a fellow minister and that fellow minister or I as a minister say to you that, you know, that's, that's really not that big of a deal in the sight of God. Don't worry about it. You know, don't get yourself all worked up about it. Peace when there is no peace. 
What about a friend who says, well, listen, you know, I know you're all anxious about this and, and let, let, let's, just, let's go out and get a drink. Can I cut close to the bone? Can I, well, let's just, be, let, come on, let's smoke, smoke a joint together. Just get something to just, just ease that anxiety. Your conscience should be afflicted. My conscience must be afflicted if there's sin. And we go to our professionals, our mental professionals, and what do they say? They prescribe this or they prescribe that. Well, don't you see and don't you understand that this preaching of false peace is a deadly, deadly thing. And when God is analyzing the nation, one of the things that he does and where he lays his most, his most heavy blows is against those who proclaim this false peace. Over and over again, we see this in, in, in the Bible. Listen to Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. Listen how similar it sounds. For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. That's an exact quotation. Look at verse 12. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. It's the same thing that we see in verses 16 and 17. Listen to other passages of scripture in Jeremiah. Then said I, O oh Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, You shall not have the sword, neither shall you have famine, but I will give you an assured peace in this place. Jeremiah 23, verse 17. They say still, they say still unto them that despise me. Listen to this. They say to those who despise me. What does it mean to despise God? It means to treat them lightly. It doesn't mean they have this ingrained and this visceral hate for God. The word despise in the old King James has this idea to treat lightly, to think nothing of. We've all been despised by people. We've, we've, we've walked by them or we've said alone. They, 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 they don't give us the time of day. But very, very lightly of us. And again, what does God say here? They say unto them that despise me. God is not to be treated lightly. They say unto them that despise me. The Lord has said you shall have peace. Imagine saying that to people who despise God. And ministers are saying these things. That was the complaint of Jeremiah. Listen to what Micah says. If a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and strong drink, he shall even be the prophet of this people. That's the kind of prophet. That's the kind of minister this people want. And so again, in this passage of scripture, what we are seeing, I hope I didn't startle the baby there. <laughs> what we're seeing in this passage of scripture uh, is, this, uh, is this failure of, 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 of men in ministry, this failure of the ministry. And so again, when, when God is, an, is giving this analysis of the sins of the nation, uh, the sins of, the, of, of spiritual leadership really come to the forefront. But there's something else that we see here, and this is what we might, might say a third category. Do you see here that when given the analysis of this nation, what else do we have here? Look in verse 15 of, uh, of Jeremiah verse six, uh, chapter 6. Look at verse uh, 16. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. This was a nation that had no shame over its sin. Its, shame, its sin meant, meant nothing to them. And again, you know, using the, the phrase that we heard from chapter 5, uh, uh, what shall I do with such a nation as this? Here is a nation again. Here is a nation using sins that we should be ashamed of as those hallmarks of pride that we set before ourselves as a nation and throughout the world. There was no shame. And so all this, why am I bringing this all up? Because this is the analysis. The assessment was rejected silver. The analysis is, yeah, take a look, and we can see why there is this assessment. So we've seen, we've seen the, uh, the analysis in general. We've seen, the, I'm sorry, we've seen the, uh, the assessment in general. We've seen the analysis particularly. Now what we come to in this passage of Scripture, and this is beautiful. This is consistent with the ways of God. Now we see the answer to this quandary that the nation is in and this is something again that we see over and over again can i say it this way that it is the it is the responsibility the duty of every preacher of the gospel not only to expose sin but to provide the answer to that sin in the person of jesus christ you see the gospel comes against this dark backdrop the gospel in all of its glory comes against the reality of the sin and all my seriousness and so what we're going to see here is that God is, going to, is God is going to give an answer to this situation. And what is the answer? It's beautiful. Look there again in verse 16. Look there at the second half of, 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 of verse 16. Uh, ask, uh, I'm sorry, look at the, the, the verse 16, the, the, the entire verse. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and seek and ask for the old path. This is the remedy. This is the answer. 
Seek the old paths where is the good way and walk therein and ye shall find uh, rest for your souls. And so what we're seeing here is that God is not only uh, giving an assessment, God is not only analyzing, God is giving an answer. And so this morning, your conscience may in some way have been touched upon. Your conscience may in some way have been smitten by the things that we hear. And let me say this, if I only left you with a smitten conscience, I would not be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But in this passage of scripture, again, the, the roadmap is laid out. The instructions are given there. Again, the preacher has the great privilege of just following what the word of God says. And what does the word of God say? To those whose consciences are afflicted, seek the old paths. God is still there for you. God is the one who is called. God is always, always, always willing and eager to receive to himself a repenting people. All the way through this, all the way through this, uh, this book of Jeremiah, as we've been considering it so far, We've had the, the judgment of God is imminent. But even while it was imminent, God was holding out hope for any that would repent. God was holding out the, the, the opportunity to return. And he still does it here in our lives today. One of the things, again, you know, that, have, that has driven me to this, to, this, uh, to this book of Jeremiah is I do believe that Jeremiah has, is, is, is useful for the day and age in which we live. I do believe that, uh, that Jeremiah, as, as Jeremiah is preaching to a people who are on the cusp of the of divine judgment, and whether or not we are on the cusp of the d divine judgment, I'm not a prophet like Jeremiah. Jeremiah knew that, that the time was up for the people. I don't know these things, but I do know this. When I see descriptions of such a nation as this, right in our face, when I see the analysis of a, of a nation by way of, it, by, by way of its oppression, by way of it being a fountain of wickedness, uh, by way of its having uncircumcised ears, by way of the, by, by way of the official uh, ministry being corrupt, what are we to say? And if God had a, had a word for his people on that day, he has a word for us. And the word is again, seek the old paths, the paths of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. That's the old, old message. The paths of holiness that God calls us to. And this Isaiah chapter 35 verse 8. And there shall be a highway in that day. And it shall be called the way of holiness. Yes, these are all the things that are consistent with what the gospel has been preaching since day one. If I can say it that way. All oh, these old paths that God has set before us. These old paths that are precious. These old paths. And it's very interesting. We have another word picture here. Did you see there in verse 16 what it says? Notice again how it's written there in verse 16. It says this, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. And the idea is this, just like in verse 30, there was a picture of the assayer, the tester of metals. Well, here in verse, in verse 16, the picture is one of a wayfarer. And there comes this man to a fork in the road. Oh, these forks in the road. How many times we have come to these forks in the road in our own lives? Decisions have to be made. Choices, sometimes hard choices, have to be embraced. And yet if we are to walk in the way that God has called us to walk, we know that sometimes the difficult thing is there. But it isn't an amazing thing. And those of you, again, who, who, have, who have followed the Lord in all of his ways, you know you've been confronted with these two choices. And when you've chosen to take that difficult way, you've found the grace of God with the next step that you've taken. God will see you through. And a matter of fact, what we're going to see here, if, if, if you look down there at verses... Uh, in verse 21, therefore thus saith the Lord, behold, I will lay stumbling blocks before the people. You know what that's a reference to? That's a reference to the man not taking the old paths, but the man taking the path that seems to be the easier path. And then as he begins down that path, all seems good for a while, and then all these stumbling blocks come up. And God is doing that. Why? Because he wants us on the good old paths. The paths of repentance, the paths of faith in Jesus Christ, the paths of holiness. But the picture here is again this. You come to this fork in the road, and you stop, and you consider, and you ask, and you look for the old paths. Don't look for these new ways. Don't look for the way that, that, that avoids, again, repentance. Don't look for the ways that avoid faith in Jesus Christ. Don't look for the ways that avoid personal holiness and, 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 and following God as he calls you to follow his word. Seek out the old paths, you see. And so that's the remedy. But this passage of scripture, there's a reason why this sixth chapter, there's a reason why this sixth chapter is a classic chapter on what I've referred to in the past. It's not my own designation, but what I've referred to in the past is that literary device, that oratorical device that's known as a Jeremiah. Remember, I've, taught, I've spoken to you about that before. And in a, in a Jeremiah, what is it? A Jeremiah is a lament over the current situation of the people. 
uh, uh, comparing it to the ideal that the people should be at, along with the remedy or along with the ways to get to that ideal. And so you have a lamenting of the situation. You have a presentation of what the ideal is, the old path. You have the way to get there. But you know what happens in this situation? Look at verses, look at verses 17 and following. The way is presented to them. I have set watchmen over you. That's to be ministers. I've set watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, listen, we will not hearken. Therefore, hear, O nations, and know, O, con o congregation. God is saying now, okay, nations, you take a look at what's going to happen to this, at, at, at this nation of Judah. I, I want all the world to see what this judgment is going to look like. Hear, O earth, and behold, and I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts. It's not arbitrary. It's not, it's, it's not without reason. The analysis has been already given, and the analysis was thorough. I will bring upon this people even the fruit of their own thoughts. Let me ask you a question here by way of application. How would you feel right now in this moment if all the evil of my thoughts or your thoughts came upon us in this moment? Do we need the mercy and, and, and grace of God? We most certainly do. But listen to what it goes on to say here. Uh, I will bring upon them the, the fruit of their thoughts because they have not hearkened unto my, unto my words nor to my law, but rejected it. You see this? We will not. We will not hear and we will not, we, we will not obey. You can say all you want. You see these ears are stopped up. These ears are uncircumcised. You can say whatever you want. And that's why God says, look, you have to understand this judgment that is coming upon this people. You, you can't imagine the severity of it. And this judgment that is about to come is going to affect every strata of society to the youngest, to the oldest. You must understand, again, God is not willing to do this. But if, if our sins continue in this path, this is, this, is, this is what our sins have brought upon us. It is the fruit of our own thoughts. And so in this passage of Scripture, then, what we've seen is we've seen this, we've seen this, this, this uh, again, this, this assessment, this analysis, and this answer. But sadly, uh, the answer is rejected. But let me say this. We don't stop here. Because while Judah had rejected uh, that, uh, that, uh, that answer, and while Judah had turned its back on the things that God was laying out before us, you and I don't have to reject it. We don't have to reject it. We can take up the cause that's being set forth here. We can, we can, we can walk in the, in, the, in the old paths. We can have our minds and our hearts fixed on the ongoing need for personal repentance. For you, for you that were with us a few weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, uh, when we were dealing with uh, uh, the doctrine of repentance in our evening services, uh, one of the things that that London Baptist Confession uh, brings out is that that little phrase that every man must repent of his particular sins, particularly no allowance for sin. My sin, my particular sin, must be repented of particularly. Oftentimes, we're good with generalities, aren't we? Yeah, I know I'm a sinner. Well, that, okay, yeah, we get that. But what about the particular sin that is bringing the particular misery? Oh, seek the old paths. Seek the path of repentance. And seek the path of faith in Jesus Christ. How can I talk about the paths of God and not mention John chapter 14, verse 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. How did you see in this 16th chapter when God says, Seek out, seek ye out the old path, and ye shall find rest for your souls? Do you think it's without reason that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come unto me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see, the rest of the old way, the path of the old way is Jesus Christ Himself. And when, G, when the soul comes to Jesus Christ, you see there's a, there's a work of the Spirit of God within. And that's why we emphasize here the way of holiness. Again, that passage in Isaiah 35, verse 8. And there shall be a highway in that day, and they shall call it the way of holiness. Well, here we've had all these things kind of opened up before us. The rejection is, is really uh, is developed uh, even further. Again, verse 19. Again, the... Uh, uh, Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring upon this people even the fruit of the thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor my law, but rejected it. Again, there's that, there's that judgment. And, no, and notice again, this is important now, because especially as we are having the Lord's Supper here today. Look at verse 20. 
To what purpose cometh there to me incense from Sheba and, from, and sweet cane from a far country? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifices sweet unto me. You have to understand, these were approved, this was the approved form of worship that God had commanded. And what God is saying to this corrupt and sinning people, do you think that your very expensive spices from a far off place can make your sacrifices acceptable to me? Do you think your willful disregard of my ways can make the very impressive external, uh, 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 external uh, religion that you have make you acceptable in my ways? Can I again come close to home? Do you think all this fine silverware, I don't even know if it's silver or not, but you think all this, uh, all, all this stuff in front of us that's supposed to look impressive, do you think that in and of itself makes the Lord's Supper that which is acceptable? No, it's the condition of the heart. And so again, what we're seeing here is that there is no substitute for what we are called to by walking and finding and seeking out these old ways. And so the folly then of, of rejecting the old ways is, is clear before us. Again, as I said in verse 21, in verse 21, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will lay stumbling blocks before this people, and the fathers and the sons together shall fall upon them, and the neighbor and his friends shall perish. The father and the son. How many times does the son look to the father and say, Dad, what should I do here? And again, if the, if the father has not chosen the good old path of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ and holiness, he brings destruction to himself and to his, and to his, and to, and to, and to his children. What about friends? If we say to our friends, oh, don't worry about it. It's not that big of a deal. Go the easy way here. Take the, what do, what? We bring destruction to ourselves and to them. And you see, again, I want, to, I want to reiterate this. Therefore, I will lay stumbling blocks before this people. You know what the good old ways are. You know what the old paths are that God has given to you. Seek not an easy way, which may appear to be easy in its first steps, but that way which God has laid out stumbling blocks. And so all these things come to us. And so again, to repeat for probably the fourth time here now, the assessment, the analysis, and the answer. Well, now we come to the applications, and how do we how do we how do we apply a passage of scripture like this? Well, as we've tried to apply every one of these chapters, we we do it by discerning in the passage what is God disapproving. We stay away from that, and what is God approving? We 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 adhere to that. And so let me set before you the following applications. Let us understand that God is always righteous in all of his judgments. God is always righteous in all of his judgments. He doesn't bring judgment upon a nation or upon individuals for no reason. Therefore, when we hear ministers and maybe even friends saying, peace, peace, when in our, in our soul, in our conscience, we know that we are not right with God. Don't listen to that message. It's a false message. And God will bring judgment on the minister and on those who follow him. Secondly, let each of us recognize our own sinfulness and, the participa and our participation in the sins of the present hour. Look there at verse 13. Again, what does it say? It's, 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 it's telling. For from the least of them, that's us, even to the greatest of them, every one of them is given the covetousness. Oh, it's so easy to say, well, this one is just taking advantage of that one. And that one over there, again, they're, they're just the most, what about us? What about us? And so again, we have, to, we have to recognize our own sinfulness. Let shame rather than pride be the attitude toward our own sin and the sins of the nation. Do you know that this land, this nation, used to, used to literally have days of humiliation and fasting for sin? Days given over for humiliation and fasting for sin? And what do we have now? We have a month given over to prideful sin. This is bizarre. Are we such a nation as this? Let us ask for the old paths. Let us be obedient to the word of God. Let us understand again that that old path is the way of repentance and the way of faith, and the way of holiness. And let's not forget primarily that the path is not merely something that we walk upon. 
but the path is Jesus Christ himself. And I set before you this day then, Jesus Christ is the answer for every one of the things that we've seen laid out before us here. May you, may I, may we walk in that path of our Lord Jesus Christ who brings us to his Father's house. If you're here this morning and your conscience is smiting you, or if you're here this morning and your ears are uncircumcised and, and none of this is penetrating, or if you're here this morning and, and you've heard these things, but you, you, but you willfully are choosing not to follow these old paths, I say unto you, number one, to repent of your sin. To those of you who are bemoaning your sin, I say unto you, look to this gracious God who is always willing to receive sinners to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. And then I say to this congregation, when we come to the table of the Lord, examine your conscience. Examine your conscience. Deal with whatever sin needs to be dealt with. God is waiting. God will hear. And then come. Come to this table and receive the blessing that Christ intends. Our Father and our God, give to us, we pray, every needed grace to hear your word, to walk in your paths, to see our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen.